All right, folks, this is Major General uh, Jim Poss, U.S. Air Force, retired with Inside Unmanned Magazine, and uh, we're going to be talking with something that I'm going to have to admit is a little bit out of character, a little <laughs> bit in character, a little bit out of character. I spent 30 years in the Air Force, and uh, Peter, you're going to be talking to us about underwater stuff. I'm doing this as a favor for Richard here to talk about <laughs> underwater stuff, but I am a diver, so I do understand. Hey, at least you know what happens the, when you get wet. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. All right, so Peter. You're, you're up here from down under. That's right. Why did you come all this way to the States? What's yeah. your major product? Yeah, so what we're, uh, what we're showing at the show today is a product called Hydrus, which is an underwater drone. Uh, Get out know, of town. It's, it's a drone show here. Okay. You know, not everything is aerial. We want to try and change some of those perceptions. You know, um, Traditionally, robotics in the underwater space, really big, expensive, you know, high maintenance costs, highly trained crew that need uh, to operate these things. Uh -huh. And we thought, well, you know, we've seen this revolution with drones happen in the last 10 or 15 years, you know. Aerial drones uh, years ago were also very difficult, expensive, right, complicated. Right. And now, you know, who's using uh, drones and quadcopters? You know, nearly anyone can Everybody. use them, right? Uh, and it's really changed the market mm -hmm. and changed the sort of user base of people who have access to that kind of data that these systems provide. And so we saw that opportunity and we thought, you know what, we need to do this underwater as well. Okay, uh, don't, don't get me started on that. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the problem I've run into, so I'm a big diver, big fisherman, uh, and all that stuff, is all of the attention in autonomous systems and uncrewed system, you know, I can't believe I'm saying this, goes to the air. Ah, come and, on. It, and there's so many problems that we've got, you know, both on the uh, consumer side and the commercial side, you know, working in uh, working in the ocean, both on the surface and below water, and we really don't get a lot of attention. So, ex tell me more about uh, your drone. What is this? A tethered, untethered, yeah, autonomous? So, so it's it's fully autonomous, untethered uh, system. Get out of town. Yeah, okay. and I mean, it only weighs uh, a couple of pounds, right? Uh, wow. You, you can put it in a backpack. You can take it on a commercial flight as check-in. You know, it's not dangerous goods. Uh, so, to develop a system that small, you know, we need to look at a lot of different technologies to actually position and navigate the thing when it's underwater. You know, as I'm sure some people will be aware, underwater has a few unique challenges in that radio waves, it's GPS wet, yeah. don't work there, salt water's nasty, you know, electronics. World's greatest corrosive, <laughs> corrosive material, salt yeah, water. exactly right. So I'm trying to solve some of those challenges of, of making, you know, a very complex system work underwater in this GNSS denied environment. Uh, present some unique challenges that we, uh, you know, we put a lot of time into uh, overcoming. So I guess uh, if we want to get into it, some of the core systems on there, we start with an inertial navigation system. Okay, uh, no, no, we got to back up a little oh, bit sure. here, and I'm going to ask you my, my questions now. So if I'm in the Gulf of Mexico, yeah. and I've got a dive boat, and I do sure. this all the time, I'm coming up to an oil rig, yeah. and I want to find out if there's any game fish there to go uh, spearing, <laughs> spear fishing. Absolutely. Would your product be useful to me? 100%, yes. So I could just pull up to the, uh, the oil rig, you plunk can, your product in the water. You quickly plan a mission of where you want it to go, what you want it to do on, on a laptop or an iPad. Uh, throw the thing over the side. I mean, I'm from New Zealand, right? I'm a Kiwi, so I tend to go for like a rugby pass when it goes over the there side. You but go. you could, I guess, some kind of football throw for you okay, guys. I'm now in. really interested, and I will <laughs> listen to you greater. So how do you navigate underwater? Yeah, how do we navigate underwater? So. We use uh, something called USBL positioning, uh, which is you're, like you're, underwater. I know you speak English yeah, well, yeah, but yeah. you're going to have to speak it better. USBL yeah, yeah. positioning, all so, right. So, yeah, this is like underwater GPS, right? So instead of using radio waves, we're using sound waves, acoustics to okay. position, okay? It's sonar-based positioning, and that gives you your absolute coordinate system, right? How does La that work? Latitudes and longitudes. This is how you get that underwater. So we have a system that goes over the side of the boat. It sends out an acoustic ping. The robot hears it and sends a position back. And the, uh, the transducer on the side of the boat can then determine the, the range and the bearing of the object that it's talking to. So you send a single buoy out that's getting a GPS signal, Correct. broadcast that down there, and you only have to have one. Just the one. And you can get enough bearing. Correct. Okay. <laughs> that's, I... So the baseline between it, that's why it's called ultra short baseline. It's, mm -hmm. it's all in one housing. Uh, and that, that will give you that position, and then we use an acoustic modem and we transfer that data down to the robot using the sound waves, and then the robot now has its equivalent of a GPS wow. position and knows where okay. it is. So that's your absolute positioning. Do you Correct. have a relative positioner? So you're not, I don't want to run into the oil rig. That's right. So we, we, uh, we turn to acoustics again for that. Hmm. So we have something called a Doppler velocity log. Okay, so I actually we, know what that is. There you so, go. Yeah. yeah, so we're sending acoustic waves out all around the vehicle, mm -hmm. uh, and we're measuring the Doppler shift on the return echo, and from those different Doppler shifts, uh, you can calculate a vector that it's okay. transiting on. 
Okay, so it's not a vision-based system, which has its challenges in the underwater environment. I'm, I'm, exactly. Uh, you've got lighting, you've got a lot of turbidity and particle matter in the water, um, right. and that can make it difficult to use that purely as a, a system you would rely on. So we, we also have a camera on board that we can use to help position and navigate ourselves. Um, but you, you kind of need multiple systems here. Okay. Um, redundancy, as I'm sure you know, is one of the keys to making sure your robots are going to work. Now, do you have to operate it autonomously all the time, or can you take manual control of it, or do you have so, to operate it manually all the time? How does that work? So, majority of the time it's operated fully autonomously. Um, the acoustic bandwidth is not as high as a radio uh, transmitter, but it gives you enough to know that it's operating on the mission plan as it's supposed to be. And if you needed to do something uh, like have it pause during the mission while you maneuver your boat, you know, someone telling you to get out of the way or you, you've caught a fish and you need to concentrate on that for a little while, right, right. Uh, you can stop the vehicle or you could say, come back to the boat, I need to get you back on board, we need to, we need to get out of there. So how do you get a video signal back? So the video is logged on board the vehicle. Okay. Uh, then you would have you would have to post process the video and download okay. it at the end. But we can run uh, sort of computer vision software on board the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So if you wanted to do object detection or classification off the camera feed, you can do that, and then you can feed um, some decisions into the autopilot based on what your auto uh, what on your computer vision uh, software is looking at. Okay. Um, so it's it's quite reactive. So a good example of where we use this is in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a certain type of starfish called the crown of thorns starfish. Very familiar with the crown of thorns. Yeah, and so they, they actually Plague damage, modern world. They yeah. damage a lot of uh, the reef structure, right? So what we can do is we can have our vehicle hydrus transit across the Great Barrier Reef and detect these crown of thorns starfish and oh, basically wow. put a waypoint on all of them. So then researchers can actually classify and like get a, get a nice data set together of if any of their mitigation strategies are working to keep these numbers down and help restore the reef. Okay, well that's great for Australia. Back to my problem. So could <laughs> I, uh, I've dropped you off on an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. I always want to know, are there yellowfin orbiting the uh, rig? Is there uh, amberjack? Would you be able to at least tell me that there's a good bit of fish life there while yeah. it's underwater? Absolutely. So you would run uh, classification image detection software on mm -hmm. board the vehicle. It's looking at the camera feed. It can see these fish that you've uh, trained your data set to recognize. Once it is uh, confident that it's seen them, it will send an acoustic signal back to your boat and say, hey, so you're get, get the rod out. This, that you can train this to tell the difference between, say, an amberjack and a yellowfin. Yeah, you could, absolutely. Wow, okay. So I would at least know whether there was those down there, then I would which, pull the card yeah, and look at and it. And I'm sure you could determine which sort of bait to put on the line after that, right? Uh, uh, well, that was going to be my <laughs> next question. Thank you for, uh, for stealing my question. But yeah, no, that's fantastic. Uh, and I'm assuming that you could also program it to, uh, you know, do a grid search if you were looking for a downed aircraft. Or, Absolutely. You know. Yeah, you know, if you want to look for shipwrecks or if you want to look for something, you know, say there's been a, a tornado or a um, hurricane come through and you need to check your shipping lane, make mm -hmm. sure there's nothing that's going to be uh, obstructing it, you can put the vehicle down there very quickly off a small little boat, have a look and get that confidence back. Wow. So what kind of sensors can you put on this? So it already has uh, quite a few sensors that it comes with. Pressure sensor, uh, it's got a contact conductivity sensor. Uh, so from that you can determine things like the velocity of sound in water. Um, we also have the option to add some third party sensors. So we're really looking at things like oceanographic sensors, so the pH, okay. uh, the methane in the water, it's dissolved salinity. oxygen levels, yeah. all that kind of thing. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, it's tell you a lot of the sort of properties of the, of the water. Um, so if you were say an oceanographer, and you're looking at um, an environmental survey, you can look at that. Or if you were looking in uh, oil and gas pipelines, you can see if there's things like methane in the area to detect for the presence of leaks, things like that. Now, can you also do an equivalent to side scan sonar, or is that a separate sensor you'd have to put on that there? would be a separate sensor. Um, with the, the DVL that I was talking about earlier, we can actually log uh, the return echo from each of those beams, and we can build a point cloud of the ocean around us, so a digital terrain model of the seabed um, while we're flying around gathering other video data. But it's not quite the fine grain point cloud you get out of a side scan well, sonar? Not quite the same as like a multi-beam, but um, we're operating at very, you know, quite close ranges, so we're not trying to do wide area mapping. We're right. trying to do detailed inspection of things, um, and so you will be building up this point cloud from quite a close range, and you get quite good resolution and from you're it. You're going to get that picture regardless because you're using that sensor for navigation. Exactly, so exactly you have right. To admit on yeah, that. So correct. what kind of duration do you get out of this? So one of the good things with working underwater, as opposed to in the air, is we're not fighting gravity all the time. So we're not using uh, thrust to keep it up. Mm -hmm. 
uh, which means we get relatively good battery life, so about three hours uh, out okay. of the system. That's not bad. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what depth are we talking about? So um, the deepest that we have at the moment, we've got a few variants. Um, we have one that goes to 3,000 meters, which is... 3,000 meters. Ten, nearly 10,000 feet in, uh, in the American units over here. We've remained loyal to the mother country in our measurements, so that's the imperial <laughs> ah, measurements. Sure, there, okay. So, yeah. Not the French, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, but um, you know, working down at uh, that kind of depth, you know, immense pressure that you have to deal with. Wow. Um, okay. So yeah, what we have to do there is make the uh, electronics on board uh, very pressure tolerant, so they're not going to mm -hmm. you know get crushed when you when you're down at that depth. So there's there's a few engineering challenges to overcome there. So is there any air spaces inside the vehicle, or is it completely? There full is of one very small pressure vessel inside. Uh, we have a. Uh, a aluminium housing for it um, that actually protects the camera sensor and then we have a ground sapphire lens out the front of it um, uh, which, so which you need to actually withstand that pressure. Okay and you have to have the air in order to uh, correct make the camera work correctly. Yeah that's right. Wow fantastic. Mm. Uh, so do you have different models? You got the... So we have one that goes to uh, 300 meters, mm -hmm. uh, 1000 meters and 3000 meters. How big are they? <laughs> they're, uh, they're, they're not much bigger than a football. Um, American or Australian slash New Zealand football? you got to be clear on <laughs> hey, that. Hey, I'm talking American. Yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. gotcha. Rugby ball. Let's rugby ball, rugby okay, ball. There you exactly. Go. About the same size, all right. Yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah, so okay. uh, yeah, fairly, fairly small units here. Yeah, but um, yeah, it makes it just easy to deploy, easy to recover. You don't need a crane, you don't need a winch mm -hmm. on the boat. You can just scoop these things up. And I'm assuming lithium ion batteries. Lith Absolutely. Can you swap correct. the batteries out? No, we, uh, we charge them using an inductive charging system, so okay. You know, much like your headphones when you used to have those wired in, it was always the connector that fails mm -hmm. on those things, and mm -hmm. that's true in underwater robots as well. So what we've done is we've put in wireless charging systems, much like on, on a phone these days, uh, so you don't actually have any connectors on this robot at all, so the whole body is totally sealed from wow. seawater. Um, so when we want to charge it, we can put it in a little station and use that wireless charging, and that actually works underwater as well. So we have a docking station that you can put down subsea, Get out of and town. you can put the vehicle, the robot will dock itself in there, recharge itself automatically, and offload any data uh, through this docking station. So what's your what's your target? Are you shooting for big oil companies, military, fisher, simple fishermen <laughs> such as myself simple who would, fishermen. would benefit from this greatly? Yeah, so we have um, we have customers that are using things these things in uh, all different um, applications. So some of the early stages um, that we're looking at where we are using the system uh, is in things like environmental surveying and mapping of, of the sea floor. Uh, reef monitoring, so that's kind of on that research side of things, um, mm -hmm. looking at growth rates and how reef structures change as ocean temperatures might change, okay. things like that. In the commercial space, we're looking at things like um, offshore wind farms. You know, what, what do you know? Like they build these wind farms in areas where the wind blows a lot. It's, it's a really yeah, dynamic yeah. environment, right? So what you need to do is inspect around the base of the wind farms on a really regular basis. You do. Checking you do. for scour, making sure the anodes are doing what they're supposed to be doing, making sure the cables are all connected properly. Uh, and when you're building a wind farm on the scale of you know thousands of these which, turbines. Which we will be which, doing, which even in the are, States. 100%, yeah. yeah. Um, this is a good case for automation. You know, you don't want a boat out there with some person operating a manual vehicle to fly around these thousands of monopiles. You want to have this happening automatically, and this is one of the applications that we've designed this for. So you're saying that uh, I've got a, a field with a thousand offshore wind farms that you'd have, you know, a dozen or so of, of your drones that would pretty much live out there, they, recharging yeah, absolutely. underwater. Absolutely, they would be resident. Once a week, they take a yeah, hook around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So they'll be continuously working, gathering the data automatically, docking back in the docking station and sending the data back to the beach. Uh, and then if you needed to do something ad hoc on the fly in the office, you can send the mission plan out to that individual robot and it can go and specifically look at wow. one thing that you needed to How do you handle marine growth? We have a few tricks up our sleeve to handle marine growth. Really? Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay. So we have a docking station uh, that sort of has uh, some chemical properties that mean not much things, not much will go on, grow on it, while still having uh, you know an environmentally friendly aspect to it. It's not chemical that's going to cause leaching. It's uh, some other little tricks we've got. <laughs> Fascinating. Mm. So, what is your business model? Are you out selling underwater drones to people, and you got to figure out how to do it, or are you so providing it as a service? We we sell them as a product. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are. We sell them to multiple different uh, organizations, some of them being rental companies, some of them being end users themselves. Uh, and then we have a training and support structure to actually get the users you know, up and running with these mm -hmm. uh, systems. So you have a, you know, 
every chance of success. Uh, having, having used a lot of underwater robots myself, you know the biggest challenge, you have your autonomous system, you're putting it over the side of the boat, it has to come back. You know, so we, always a good thing. We have a system in place to train the users uh, and who, who are purchasing, purchasing these things to get that confidence up and know how to use these things. How, how do you recover the system? I mean, it... so because it because it has such a high end uh, navigation system on board, it can come back to a set waypoint, uh, and then you can navigate your boat there. So you can either say come back to me to the boat or <coughs> come to this specific waypoint, and it, it will go there and hold for you. Uh, and but that can it's got be done. a marker it can deploy, right? <laughs> or it, it, it has uh, it has some very bright lights on board that okay. you can see. Uh, it's got a GPS on board, so when it hits the surface, it gets a GPS fix oh, and okay. drive and back. And also yeah, broadcast right. your GPS. Okay, exactly. I'll buy that. That's, that's good. <laughs> so, are you planning on having a, a a real consumer model of this? So, we're planning on uh, mass producing these things. So, we're in the process of. Uh, <laughs> building a factory at the moment to build these things by the thousand, right? So one of the beauties of building every single subcomponent on board in-house and having that IP is we can have that, you know, these gains from vertical uh, integration and manufacturing, which mm -hmm. means we can really drive the price point of this down. Um, open it up, open up the, um, the right. market to a lot so of other what, people. What are we roughly talking <laughs> when you're full scale for your consumer model? Yeah. So, I mean, look, it's still uh, coming in at about 50K US mm -hmm. for one of these products, but as soon as you start looking at things like the operating cost of hiring boats and that sort of thing, you know, right. if you can hire a smaller boat where you don't need a crane to deploy your robot, all of a sudden this thing's paying for itself in, in days. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there'd be a great rental market. I would, I would love, if I was on the Great Barrier Reef, I would rent one of your things just to follow me around. And, Absolutely. You know, give me great stuff. <laughs> yeah. Ideally, tell me where the crown of thorns are. Too. Exactly. Well, great stuff. Well, is there anything else that we haven't discussed that you'd like to talk to us about? I think we covered the covered the waterfront. I think uh, we've covered most of the waterfront thing. here. Um, yeah, I, I think um, you know this is uh, the, the point that I'd like to finish on is really just um, you know it's, it's a bit of a step change in what's happening in underwater robotics. You know, this is kind of finally this confluence of multiple different technologies coming together: battery technology, onboard AI, mm -hmm. uh, along with these navigation systems, all coming together to actually produce something that you know, can bring the drone revolution that we've seen underwater. Okay, and I'm assuming you guys are also working on an air variant so I don't have to go out to every flock of birds <laughs> to see if there's fish underneath there or no. We have uh, we have some very interesting drone fleet control software that can uh, definitely assist Okay, that. okay. Yeah. That doesn't corrode and fall apart after. Exactly. Okay, all right. Well, that's great stuff. Well, Peter, it's great meeting you. Thank and you very much. Good to, best of luck to you. Cheers.